Hello and welcome to Reclosure 2020. I'm Dr. Christian Beetz from Hamburg, Germany, and in the next 25 minutes or so, I will introduce you to our work at Data42, where we use Enclosure and Closure Script to create a visual analytics platform um, with one important use case, peace building. So join me to see how we try to improve the world bit by bit by using Closure. Let me first introduce myself. I'm a software uh, Software engineer and an engineering manager with an AI background for almost 25 years. Um, I've developed open source, um, especially libraries for Apache Spark and uh, the Neo4j Graph database. And at Data42, I helped create, create the Open60 platform. Open60 is our software toolkit um, for subject matter experts to understand complex situations from data. Think of it as a notebook application on steroids where as a user, um, you do not need to write a single line of code or uh, SQL statements, um, but be supported in finding the right data, visualize it, and generate insight into complex situations. And one of the complex situations, and the one I'm focusing on today, is um, crisis early warning and situational awareness in the context of peace building. So I will show you um, what peace building entails and how data and tech can help create a better, um, a better world, basically. I will show you Open60's overall architecture and some of the properties Clojure um, brings to this. Um, I hope from this talk um, you take three things. A, there are problems in our world which need our attention, um, even in tech conferences. B, um, What's the coolest feature of Clojure, in my opinion, and how it contributed um, to our software architecture? <clears throat> and C, that's the most important one. There are ways to use tech and data to create a better world. After listening to my talk, go find your way from improving access to uh, education, to humanitarian AI, to more energy efficiency. Um, possibilities are, are endless. But let's dive in. What does peace building mean? Let's look at a particular area as an example, the Sahel. Um, the Sahel has a, a number of problems. It's often hit by droughts, but also by floods, um, both leading to food unsafety. Um, there's, there are health risks, um, displacement. Um, it's an area where women are threatened, um, education is under attack, uh, a region with organized crime, corruption, and even armed conflicts. And often, this is a vicious circle, which is extremely hard to break up. So, peace building needs to understand the most dire problems of people, and um, which are the cause of conflicts, or might become the cause of conflicts, to address these causes. Um, so, for example, are armed conflicts cause or effects of a crisis? Um, peace building also needs to evaluate prior action. What did work? Um, what were the successful factors for stuff to, to, to really work? Uh, what didn't? Um, can we build upon stuff which worked? So we can make future improvement. Um, for example, um, can we assess whether um, microloans made a positive effect? And if so, um, is, it, is it as microloans in general or are there specific um, properties to microloans which, which make it um, successful? Um, and peace building also needs to identify relevant actors. Um, to talk to, who's the right person and or the right organization to foster the change which is necessary. So, understanding the, the underlying causes, um, first and foremost, needs a lot of experience, no doubt for that. Technology will never replace that. However, resources are limited, even for these extremely uh, important tasks. So technology can help focus, it can help combine experience and expertise on, on one side with 
evidence derived from the data on the other side, and it ha can help tell a story to convey a message. So what does it mean for us? Um, as I mentioned earlier, Data42, we're building a software toolkit for data analytics. Peace building can be supported by using data from multiple sources. Um, the UN, especially UNHCR, um, World Bank, the World Health Organization, or initiatives like Yati and Aklet, um, which, um, which gather data and disperse it. Um, so the situation is like with every data science project. Um, some of the data is public, um, e.g. from the World Bank and or the UN. Some is obstructed, which means you can, you can um, buy it, but it's not in the right format. It's uh, hidden in, in news articles or whatever, and you have to extract the relevant information. Um, some is internal to an organization, like um, surveys performed by, ground, by personnel operating on the ground. Um, also, data is dirty, which means it's not... Um, not produced in a way um, with machine or with automatic uh, analysis in mind. Um, it's not, not interconnected. Data from one source um, doesn't refer to the same objects or entities um, as um, data from another source. And data is sparse, meaning data is only available for specific countries or specific regions. So to help with data integration, we utilize a knowledge graph. And the knowledge graph links data from different sources to common entities. Um, and it also helps to create a UI for the, for the user, for the subject matter expert, to guide his, um, his way in, into the data and uh, the, the exploratory access. And on top of that, um, we, we use visual analytics, which is an approach um, to derive knowledge from large data sets and complex data sets by combining automatic data analysis uh, on, on one hand side with, um, with visualizations on the other hand side, combining um, the best of both worlds from um, machine and human interaction. So with these complex situations, and especially in, in um, and peace building and conflict um, detection or conflict um, early warning. It is usually um, too much data for a human to process every bit. Um, so automation is necessary um, and usually means um, simplifying the access or enriching data, um, both trying to prioritize um, human effort. However, um, in, in this special or in this um, area of area of interest, um, it's not enough to have an overview. But every detail matters. Um, you all know that from from uh, other domains. Um, I will come to that uh, in a moment. And uh, another thing which is necessary: the data isn't isolated. You need a strong domain background or strong uh, domain knowledge to interpret um, the data, to uh, make meaning of the data, to understand the, the impact of your analysis. Um, so, sounds familiar? You all know, know that sort of um, situation um, I'm talking about. For you, you are domain experts in creating software and thus in debugging software. And logging and monitoring is creating vast amounts of data, um, which you need an overview of. Um, did something occur yesterday or the last week or the last months? Um, but the overview is not enough. You have to dig into every detail, um, which kind of exception um, occurred, for example, and under one, what circumstances. Um, and also you need to have a vast amount of background knowledge. You have to know um, the code, the system, you have, an have to have an understanding of what's happening. Um, you need knowledge about um, which machines are, um, are entailed and which network and which processes are co-located and stuff like that. So without um, the domain knowledge and background information, there's no way to interpret all that data. And the same is true um, 
for all the data required for peace building. So, <clears throat> to sum up, visual analytics is a combination of well-crafted general purpose mechanisms and sometimes very specific visualizations for just a specific kind of complex problem. And at Data42, we interact with experts to, to learn and to understand in order to improve our product, and on the other hand side, use it to evangelize tech as an assistive measure to co-create um, solutions, especially in that, in that area um, of peace building. In the area of peace building, one of the exchange formats um, was an expert forum we, um, we ran in August of 2020, where we brought together people from NGOs and technology providers to share insights and to, to find a common understanding and um, to build up relationships. And this approach of co-creation is very important as a driving force in our product development, um, which also affects our software architecture, as you will see in, in a bit. But first, let me show the building blocks we, we came up with. Um, the groundwork is a data model, with, uh, which is both flexible, so we can add diverse data sets, and performant, up to a reasonable amount of, of data, backed by a knowledge graph to bridge data from different silos. Um, on top of that, we have a series of services um, to attach to different data providers, um, and different data storages, from SAP HANA to Elasticsearch, for example. And um, again, on, on top of this is uh, a micro framework um, to support a UI built from several components, backed by a common um, work environment or working context, as we call it, which is um, responsible, e.g., for, for synchronizing selection um, of data between different visualizations. And, um, of course, the visualization components are, a, are a, another building block, um, from maps to, to network views, to something um, we created um, for, for the very specific use case, the Graphical Object Set Explorer, which is a pannable and zoomable view of all the events. So can you, you can have an overview of everything or dig into a specific event. Um, and around that, we have lots of utilities from property-based access control to project management um, to, to shared configuration. So, Within this architecture, we, we develop something we call verticals, which is a combination of microservice and micro app front end. Our microservice and micro app approach is basically derived from the fact that we expected to learn new things along the way um, at a different pace for every item. Um, so we wanted to be able to change things and improve features uh, in, that, in that verticals. Um, that worked out basically very well, um, but of course um, we we had some learnings which made it necessary um, to to change stuff in or to to touch stuff in in every vertical down uh, and to do so safely. Um, CI is a very very important feature for us, um, and we are relying on on two stuff uh, two things I would like to share and one. Um, is line monolith. Uh, we, we're using extensively at um, several of our verticals because they consist of uh, a number of services um, and a number of uh, client components, um, which might be the UI um, component, but also client libraries for, for others to use or to consume um, um, the services. And line monoliths give us a way to um, create a monorepo for each vertical uh, and to create different artifacts from that um, monorepository. And the other thing we heavily rely on is um, line V, um, which is a lining plugin to have all the versioning information in the Git repo in form of tags. So every time we create a build, um, we are we're tagging it from the CI, and that's the, the version we're using everywhere. So um, CI and Git repo 
and the the artifacts um, in in our artifact repository and the artifacts on our machines um, are aligned. We can every we can ask everyone for the same um, version information. Definitely um, worth looking at. So another thing um, which is which is really important. For, for me, with like uh, 10, 10, 10 years of closure experience, uh, I'm always astonished to, to, to find, uh, find it really hard to grasp for newbies to closure. Um, but so extremely important, I want to stress it here, is um, the REPL. Um, the, the REPL and its possibilities it, it creates um, to not only to write your code, but to access your application as, as my top closure feature. Um, let me just entail the process. I create, I use a REPL basically to create every new feature and or every new functionality. Um, and this is especially um, good if you create um, stuff with no pre-existing API or UI for, of course, um, because it gives you an access to the functionality, um, but there's one caveat or one thing you have to look out for. Um, it's easy to diverge between um, what you're basically creating on the on the REPL and what you plan in, to do or what you what you need to do in in the UI. So my advice here is to start um, with a with a pen and paper prototype for your UI and to mimic the behavior of the user in in the UI. Um, on, on the record from the top, so have, follow a top-down approach. Um, well, that's one thing, and the other one is um, in, in the REPL you have the possibility to create abstractions from the bottom up, um, to create a domain-specific language basically um, for, for your problem. So um, what we have is access to our data, which is, um, uh, which is like provided on the, on the REPL and you can interact with it. Um, and so I'm trying to mix the, the top-down and the bottom-up approach. Um, it's good practice to embed code um, in the namespace to run stuff in the REPL. Um, and you can do that easily um, by utilizing the, the hash underscore reader macro or the comment um, macro. Um, and so you can have it as a sort of coming back to, to stuff which, uh, which is important, but also a means of docu documenting um, things uh, for, for others to grab up. Um, but be aware that neither of this is tested. So it's um, easy for the code um, in, that, in that comments and the real code um, for production to diverge. Um, so basically, when you're finished developing stuff, you should um, create Tests from from that um, from that stuff. So another thing um, which you should pay attention is uh, to is um, and which I often see like neglected is you should make aware uh, you should make sure um, that you can easily reload stuff on the REPL. And the point where where, where I see this often um, failing because of where, where I'm working on is. Um, with um, HTTP handler functions. Um, if, you, if you have the handling functions and the routing functions in the same namespace and you reload the, the same space, you basically not only create a new um, handling function, but also a new routing function, which is not active in your, in your server. So if you, um, if you shoot um, an HTTP request to your server, it will use the old routing function and by that the old um, handling function and your stuff isn't um, is active. So that's easy to fix just by just by separating the namespaces and um, making sure you can reload everything easily. And with all that in mind, um, if you if you really develop stuff in the REPL in the REPL, REPL driven um, REPL first environment, um, I made the experience that it improves the overall design of my software architecture um, and it makes a more resilient system. And if you want to learn more about that, 
I recommend Brandon Rhodes' um, talk. Um, you can find it on, on YouTube also. Um, the Clean Architecture in Python, which is from uh, 2014, where he shows that idea um, of what to do um, in Python, and you can perfectly have it in, in Clojure. So we're trying to improve the world from the rapid bit by bit, I told you. And we're, um, as we're not in the analysis business ourselves, that's only partially true. Um, we create a format called Use Case of the Months, where our product management team is using our tool to analyze current trends um, on linked open data. So they assess um, progress on, on mine clearance in Nigeria or analyze situation in Mali with respect to and peace building mission MINUSMA. And we take that as an, as an input um, to our um, product um, development process. So peace building is, is only one of the domains we are working in, uh, but it's a very important one. And uh, what we see especially and what we learn from the current um, corona situation is how much value lies in data and its proper interpretation um, by using computationally augmented um, um, domain expertise on one hand side, um, um, and the, the ability to understand or dig into complex situations. And this will outgrow the use of dashboards and infographics, as you, as you know. I think um, that's a very, very interesting point to, to watch in the future. So thank you very much. Um, and if you want to connect, find me on Twitter as Chris underscore Bates, uh, or reach out to um, data42 underscore Hamburg. Now, one last thing, with all the things you know and you are able to do and to achieve, go find your way of creating a better world. Bye.